Now, our Adapting for Disabilities Q&A session with Dr. Luis Perez, CAST, Dr. Fatima Elvira Terrazas Arellanes, University of Oregon, Dr. Jessica Amsbury, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, Dr. Kent McIntosh, University of Oregon, and Dr. Wendy Sapp, our moderator from Bridge Multimedia. Hi, thank you so much for joining us for this Q&A. So I know that a lot of the, the Q&A were already answered um, in the box, but I think I'm going to bring them up so we can hear um, some of these answers as well for everyone. Um, I know there was a question um, for the STEMI program about what CROWD stands for, C-R-O-W-D. What it really is is a way to support folks. Um, it's sort of that piece related to storybook conversations with young children. And so C is complete a sentence. Um, uh, R is recall. Um, o is open-ended questions. Uh, the W means uh, like sort of WH questions. And then D means sort of distancing questions. And so, for example, maybe I'm giving way too much information, but for completing a sentence with SIG, it might be like, um, Sid had to go to the doctor not twice, but how many times and asking, you know, children to um, provide that information or um, maybe an open ended questions for that book is how many beds does Sid have. And so there's some of the ways we've tried to connect it to from the book to STEM uh, using that sort of crowd um, approach that helps parents and caregivers and practitioners to really uh, support children and kind of moving forward in um, their STEM understanding. And Ching, I don't know if you have anything to add, but I think that's we that's the big pieces. Yeah, so we definitely did not make up the um, yes. the crowd acronym. It's actually from um, something called dialogic reading, which has a really strong evidence in um, early childhood and um, helping kids um, support kids with um, their language and literacy skills. Thank you. Um, I, we have a question here for Fatima about accessibility and the science materials, um, about them being, whether they are free to access and for how long they might be free if they are. Sure. Um, they are currently free. They have been free for the last 10 years since we developed them. And we have uh, thought about commercialization for the purpose of sustaining after our funding stream ends. Fortunately, we just got a new funding for the next five years, so there is no need to commercialize it. But we're always concerned that at some point when we don't have funding to sustain it, sustain it we will have to consider that option. Um, and, but for now, the next five years uh, is free. And because of the agreement that we have with our funding, all of the content always have to be free. That doesn't mean that we don't, uh, that we cannot sell services or features of the program. So if we ever commercialize, it will be the services, the features of the program, uh, which will, what we will be selling. But the content itself needs to be uh, and the Creative Commons for free. Excellent, thank you. And there was a second question for you, Fatima, about accessibility by Braille note takers or JAWS. And if you could speak a little bit about where the product is now and where you hope to take it, that would be wonderful. Sure. Um, we follow that guidelines for accessibility that are requiring a website. Uh, the one that uh, was requested about is the first time I see it. Uh, like I mentioned, the program and the focus of our program is for students with high incidence disabilities. However, because we have to follow the accessibility guidelines, we have all tags, our documents are formatted in a way that um, speech readers can um, read them correctly. But that particular functionality that was asked for is not something that we currently have but I'm glad that it was brought up to me because it's something that I can definitely check. And if, if there is something that is easy for us to address, we address it when we find out that it's a need. And right now I know that it's a need. So I'm gonna look into it for sure. Wonderful, thank you. 
Kent, um, could you take a minute and just, if you had to give parents and teachers one piece of advice for using your Be Positive app uh, well with their students or their children at home, what would that be? Sure. It, uh, it's intended to be really, really broad. Um, and so what I would suggest people do is they can think of any behavior that they want to cue themselves to increase the use of. So we started with thinking about what are high leverage practices, like providing opportunities to respond and providing behavior specific praise. But in reality, it could really be anything. And you just set a timer for how frequently you want to be prompted to do it. And then it'll just notify you right in your phone system for how to do it. Great, thank you, Kent. And Luis, if you had to say, what's the biggest challenge that teachers or parents face when they start trying to, to look at UDL and begin with it, um, and then how that could be overcome, what would you say? I think it's uh, potentially getting overwhelmed at first, but I always uh, preach taking a plus one approach. So try out one thing uh, at a time this week, see how it works, um, you know, collect some data on it, and then move on to the next thing. So really take on a growth mindset, the same growth mindset that we want our learners to have. Uh, we as educators and as parents, we should uh, approach learning with that same growth mindset. Wonderful, thank you. Um, Megan or Ching, could you give us an example of um, just a fun activity that, that parents could use, use within your STEMI projects, uh, science or technology? activity um, for the very young children. This is an example to get people thinking. Yeah, so I think there's a, you know, a lot of activities. Um, and actually on our webpage, um, I know Ching and I were just chatting about making sure that after this, all the resources are really um, available. But I think the piece um, that we had Jessica share within the video related to sort of some activities you can do at home with the storybook reading. Um, that is a really, that is a series that we've developed that, that allow you to use whatever you have at home um, and sort of help support you with some of the STEM um, content as you're reading some of those books as well. Um, and I will say we are um, also in the process, we have a couple of series of, of blogs that have provided some information that might be helpful for families at home in terms of um, within those curated resource set. Um, and I'll let Ching also share, but I think some of those curated resources that we put together have some things about talking about um, COVID, which might be some things that also really connect to uh, STEM for very young learners. It's all geared towards how do we support children during this time as well uh, with the STEM knowledge and understanding. Um, and I will say maybe as another piece is we are in the process of developing activities that can be used in classrooms and programs and at home as well. Um, I think most folks maybe know we were in the process of just getting ready to start testing some of those. And then um, we had the pandemic hit and we had to stop working in um, programs and at home. So we definitely will have more to come and you'll be able to find all of those pieces at our website. Great. Uh, we have a question, and this could go to um, several of you, I think, but uh, I saw that Luis answered it in the box, but um, anyone else who'd care to add as well. Recommendations for resources about read-along tips for parents who have CIASD teenagers who are using board maker supports. So if there's any suggestions for that, Luis, why don't you start with um, your response, and then we'll see if anybody else would like to add other resources. So I, I recommended the immersive reader feature from Microsoft. It's built into a number of Microsoft tools, including Microsoft Word, OneNote, uh, and so on. And it has um, really nice text-to-speech, but it also has a picture dictionary that's built in. And it uses board maker symbols that uh, the student may already be familiar with. So they don't have to learn another symbol library. Megan, did you have something to add? Well I was going to add, as you know, we work uh, more in birth to five with very young children, but I think one of our big pieces, as we talk about in STEMI, is making sure that we're um, thinking about what, how you can incorporate STEM into what you're currently doing. So, like, if you're at home, how do you put it into your routines and activities? And I think, um, and so some of that might be related to, like, you know, if you're doing bath time or if you're, you know, at the dinner table, how do you incorporate some of those pieces? So with the activities and some, and Lewis, I think what you said is how do we make sure it's really connected to what we're already doing, I think is the big key pieces. Um, and I do see that there was a question related to students that are 
deaf blind. And I think that's the other piece we've also been talking about is how do we make sure we're focused on, you know, f- what, what a child functionally needs versus this is, this child has disability X. It's really thinking about what are the strengths and needs so that we can um, support children and engaging within that STEM. And for us, it's STEM content, but I think that's pretty applicable to other things as well. So we've really been trying to think about as we provide supports and tips, how do we really build on kids' strengths and needs? Thank you, Luis and Megan. Um, and let's continue with that question. The um, actual question about deafblind was, do, does anyone have activities for students who are deafblind? Um, Megan's already given a little bit of uh, one way to approach that, um, looking functionally where the, the child is. Does anyone else have comments on that? Um, I would just emphasize that this kind of raises the important for when we share videos to make sure that there are transcripts as well as the captions because transcripts are really the only way that we can make that information available to someone who's deafblind because the text in the transcript can then be converted to Braille, uh, which really brings up the need to have robust Braille education, uh, even as we move into the world of technology. And I'm as big an advocate as possible as there is out there for the use of text-to-speech and other technologies, but I also believe in the power of Braille uh, for giving learners independence. And so starting as early as possible with robust Braille education is important. Yeah. I think we have addressed um, the questions that I see in here, and I apologize if I missed any. Um, does anybody have a final uh, 30 seconds comment they would like to share? No, this was great. We were really excited to be a part of this, and it was kind of really nice to see that we had sort of birth to 21 represented or birth to beyond and really thinking about how we can support all learners and and having, you know, each and every learner and having engagement and access to different content and different, um, uh, different resources. I thank each of our presenters. Thank you, Ken, to Luis and Fatima and Megan and Ching and Rachel, who was not able to join us for the Q&A. Um, Thank you very much, and we will move on to our next session now. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Bye.